uh, Tocqueville Forum for inviting me here. Uh, any day that we can talk about Madison and the Constitution is a day well spent. And I also want to say happy feast here on this eve of the Annunciation. So uh, the Constitution, as we all know, was written in 1787. But was it pro-slavery or was it anti-slavery? And interestingly, that question was answered, if not asked, before the ink was dry on the parchment, that already different partisan sides were seeking to give narratives about the Constitution, and those narratives were shaped in order to achieve certain political purposes. So you have Pennsylvanian James Wilson, who was defending the Constitution at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, and arguing that the 20-year compromise, which merely said that Congress could not do anything about the slave trade for 20 years, according to Wilson, it laid the foundation for banishing slavery out of this country. Now, Wilson was one of the framers of the Constitution. He had spent three months with the Southern members who had also framed the Constitution. He knew that this clause did no such thing, but that's what he said it did. But meanwhile, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, another framer of the Constitution, was giving his own read on the same clause in South Carolina. According to him, by this settlement, we have secured an unlimited importation of Negroes for 20 years, nor is it declared that the importation shall be then stopped. It may be continued. Now, Pinckney had spent three months with northern and middle state uh, delegates who made it perfectly clear that they were going to end the slave trade at the earliest possible moment. He knew that this wasn't true, but this is the interpretation that he gave to it. Meanwhile, anti-federalists were doing their own bit to give spin to the Constitution in order to defeat the Constitution. For instance, James Neal of Massachusetts spoke against the slave trade and warned that the Constitution favors the making of merchandise of the bodies of men because of the slave trade compromise. And in spite of the fact that all of his compatriots tried to convince him that under the Articles of Confederation, the slave trade could continue indefinitely, whereas under the Constitution, there was an option of nationally prohibiting it in just 20 years, that didn't change Neal's calculus. He still insisted that the Constitution was pro-slavery, so he would vote against it. Meanwhile, anti-federalist Patrick Henry was giving his own reasons to his fellow Virginians why they should not adopt the Constitution. He said that they should reject it because under this Constitution, the North would liberate every one of your slaves if they please. And he predicted that they could do it, for instance, as a wartime measure. And this prediction only looks prescient in retrospect. At the time, it looks totally paranoid. So the immediate cause of these arguments ended when the Constitution was ratified. But the two different narratives about whether the Constitution was pro-slavery or anti-slavery did not. It continued right up through the Civil War. And in fact, it heated up in the antebellum, antebellum era and became more and more intense and polarized. And so you've got William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, who one Fourth of July celebration held up a copy of the Constitution and set it on fire, calling it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because of its slavery compromises. Meanwhile, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln argued that the Constitution properly understood was anti-slavery. Lincoln making the remarkable claim that the framers of the Constitution intended and expected the ultimate extinction of slavery. So as we all know, with the 13th Amendment, slavery was finally abolished under the Constitution. So one would be forgiven for believing that with the end of slavery, that would then end the partisan divisions over the interpretations of the Constitution over slavery. And if one did believe that, one would be mistaken. In fact, in the current debate right now, there has probably been no more partisan divide on this question since the antebellum era. To give just some
some examples of what I'm talking about. In the year 2000, Joseph Ellis published Founding Brothers, which contained a chapter called The Silence, which talked about James Madison's participation in the anti-slavery petitions that were submitted to the First Congress in 1798. According to Ellis' telling, this was the last possible moment when Congress was actively considering gradual emancipation uh, projects nationwide, and James Madison single-handedly turned their intentions away from this noble project and closed forever the last possible moment to emancipate slaves peacefully in this country. It is a beautifully written narrative of lost opportunities. It is also riddled with errors and completely distorts the, the story, the real story being that Madison was actually a friend and ally of the abolitionist petitioners. Nevertheless, Ellis's book won the Pulitzer Prize for history the next year. In 2015, Mary Sarah Builder published Madison's Hand, revising the Constitutional Convention, which made several allegations against Madison in the way that he wrote his notes of the Constitutional Convention, including the allegation that he had falsely inserted anti-slavery speeches of his own devising later, which were never actually spoken at the Constitutional Convention. These allegations are based on a combination of baseless speculation, some factual error, and some mischaracterization of the evidence. Uh, Madison's Hand won the 2016 Bancroft Prize, which is one of the most prestigious prizes given to works in American history. In 2016, Ibram X. Kendi published Stamped from the Beginning, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. Now, the definitive history only has two pages on the Constitutional Convention. But within these two pages, there are about a half dozen factual errors, all of which tend to give a fictionalized account exaggerating the degree to which the framers of the Constitution were racist and pro-slavery. Candy's book won the 2016 National Book Award for nonfiction. In 2019, the New York Times published the 1619 Project, and its lead essay by Nicole Hannah Jones gives the standard neo garrisonian interpretation of the Constitution as being pro-slavery. But more controversially, the author claimed, quote, that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Indeed, she went on to say that we may never have revolted against Britain if the founders had not believed that independence was required in order to ensure that slavery would continue. Five leading historians wrote a letter to the editor complaining about the factual errors and in particular about these claims about the revolution. Jake Silverstein, the editor of this series, defended all the claims in the piece, def uh, touting the New York Times rigorous fact-checking process during which, quote, our researchers carefully reviewed all the articles in the issue with subject area experts. However, a few months after this defense, it came out that the fact-checker checker who worked with Hannah Jones, Leslie M. Harris, revealed that she had urged them not to make that claim, but the Times ignored her advice and published the incorrect statement about the American Revolution anyway. The lead essay in this series won the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for commentary. So, just because there is a dominance today of the neo garrisonian narrative about the Constitution does not mean that there, is no, there are no publications at all on the other side. In the year 2020, President Trump assembled a commission which drafted a competing narrative that, was, that came out as the 1776 report. This narrative was a one-sided, neo-Lincolnian interpretation that the Constitution was anti-slavery, as was the entire founding. And it did include a couple of factual errors in order to build its case. 
Nevertheless, the 1776 report and the 1619 project are two sides of the same coin, both of them giving the competing narratives that have been with this country from the beginning. Methodologically, there's no real difference between them. The difference comes in how each one is treated. Two days after the 1776 report was released, the American Historical Association formally condemned it, as in a formal condemnation of it on their website. And the condemnation was signed by 47 additional organizations representing historians and other scholars. By contrast, the 1619 project won the Pulitzer Prize, and it is used as curriculum in over 4,500 schools and counting. Hence, an attempt to make a neo-Lincolnian argument that the Constitution was anti-slavery is about as popular today as it would have been in South Carolina in the 1840s. <laughs> <laughs> but really, seriously, the Constitution, was it pro-slavery or anti-slavery? In essence, this is a fatuous exercise because it presumes that there is just one answer to that question, when in fact the Constitution has been written by 55 different individuals, each one of which having their own intention and ideas about what the Constitution should be in regard to slavery. And any serious investigation about the Constitution's stance with regards to slavery is going to have to take into account the very diverse opinions that they brought with them. And on no question was there more a more serious and profound difference, <coughs> philosophical difference, than on this question of slavery. Therefore, if anyone wants a, an impartial investigation into this question, it has to be divided into individual clauses of the Constitution or individual members of the Constitutional Convention. But what did the most influential of the framers of the Constitution, the one who is popularly known as the father of the Constitution, not only because of his outsized influence on the way that the Constitution was shaped, but perhaps even more so because of his influence on the way that we understand that Constitution, what was his interpretation of the Constitution? If we ask that question, and we ask, what is Madison's Constitution? And by Madison's Constitution, I mean the Constitution that he had attempted to get passed within the Constitutional Convention, the way he defended various provisions of the Constitution while they were being framed, and even some of the creative interpretations he gave to these clauses after the fact. We find that Madison is rather consistent in his argument that this is an anti-slavery Constitution. But to say that, I want to also clarify that Madison is anti-slavery, not abolitionist. If we mean by that term that an abolitionist is someone who prioritizes slavery's abolition above everything else, Madison was not willing to sacrifice peace, order, the rule of law, or popular government for the sake of abolition. In addition, as a Southerner, he often defended Southern interests, even though those interests, especially the economic interests of the South, were tied to slavery. And finally, he even defended some clauses which protected slavery explicitly, such as the Fugitive Slave Clause. But the Constitution has always been judged according not only to the practical outcome of certain clauses, but also because of its symbolic meaning. And although we, may, we might not take that second part seriously in the abstract, I would venture to say that the symbolic meaning of the Constitution has always had a more powerful effect on people's arguments than the practical outcome. And Madison was consistent in his argument that the inherent meaning of the Constitution was anti-slavery. Now, it is well known that the Constitution was worded in such a way so that no explicit sanction to the institution of slavery would be given. For instance, the word slave never enters into the text of the Constitution. 
And Madison was explicit as to why that was. As he later recalled, some of the states had scruples against admitting the term slaves into the instrument. This was done, he went on to say, to satisfy those who were scrupulous of acknowledging expressly a property in human beings. Now, no one knows who was responsible, who in the singular or plural, for ensuring that the word slave never entered into the Constitution, but many attribute that to Madison. And I tend to think that that is probably correct, that he was at least among those who ensured that the word slave never entered into the Constitution. It is consistent both with the way that he interpreted the Constitution, but also from a sort of long-standing habit he has of taking himself out of the picture and talking in the passive voice whenever he is the primary agent of certain historical events. But we see the exact method by which this happens in the framing of the Fugitive Slave Clause. The Fugitive Slave Clause, which, by the way, is the worst clause in the Constitution by almost any measure whatsoever. Um, but the wording of the Fugitive Slave Clause was revised twice in order to remove any sanction within the federal realm of the idea of slavery. Originally, as it was proposed and voted on, the Fugitive Slave Clause would have read that fugitive slaves, quote, shall be delivered up to the person justly claiming their service or labor. Now that formulation was changed within the Committee of Style, and we have no notes as to what went on in any of the special committees, even in the ones in which Madison served. And Madison was one of the five-member team on the Committee of Style. Somewhere in that committee, the word justly was dropped, and the phrase, no person legally held to service or labor, was added. But then, within the arguments in the Constitutional Convention, even the term legally was struck out, and the words, under the laws thereof, as in, under the laws of the states, were, ins was ins were inserted. Quote, in compliance with the wish of some who thought the term legal equivocal, and favoring the idea that slavery is legal in a moral view. So again, there's no mention as to who was behind the word change. But nevertheless, it was clear that in the formulation of the wording of this clause, it would give no explicit sanction to slavery, even as it formed a clause which would protect the property and slaves of the slave owners. But although we don't know who was behind these maneuvers, there's one thing that we can say with some certainty, and that is no one would know about these verbal machinations if it were not for Madison's notes. Because only in the records that he left behind can we find out that these were a deliberate choice of the framers. And because this was known later on, it became a powerful tool among the anti-slavery contingent. For instance, Justice McLean, who was one of those who dissented in the Dred Scott decision, could counter Tommy's argument by saying, quote, we know as a historic fact that James Madison was solicitous to guard the language of that instrument so as not to convey the idea that there could be property in men. And Abraham Lincoln could say, quote, we must make good in essence as well as in as inform Madison's avowal that the word slave ought not to appear in the Constitution. These became a powerful argument that could not have been used if Madison had not left behind these records. One of the interesting things about the way that Madison argued in the Constitutional Convention is that he often prioritized the implicit meaning of certain words and clauses even over their practical effect. And nowhere is that more clear than when the slave trade clause uh, was argued. Now, nearly everyone north of South Carolina wanted an immediate end to the slave, international slave trade. But South Carolina and Georgia insisted that some compromise be made. A committee was formed on which Madison served. And according to the report by that committee, a compromise was made 
which would give to those states now existing an opportunity to import slaves until the year 1800. When that report was debated in the Constitutional Convention, General Pinckney, who was also on the committee, who had just forged that compromise, tried to extend the years from 1800 to 1808. Madison was the only person in the committee to object to the lengthen, lengthening term. And he, he objected it, to it with these words, so long a term will be more dishonorable to the American character than to say nothing about it in the Constitution. So essentially what he was saying is, if we allow the slave trade for 20 years that will show such a complacence about the international slave trade that it will be more dishonorable than if we say nothing at all about it in the Constitution, in which case the slave trade can be continued indefinitely. It's one of the examples where he's prioritizing the implication that will be given, the message that will be given to these words over even the practical effect. Madison's objections were ignored, the votes were in the favor of South Carolina, and the year was extended. Later, when Madison was defending the Constitution as it stood, he perpetually said that although 20 years was longer than everyone wished, it was a great point gained in favor of humanity that but 20 years and we can put an end to the slave trade. There are other examples of the power of the symbolic meaning of the Constitution, which is much less appreciated. And one of those is Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, which was used by both pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. Article 4, Section 4 contains two clauses that do not immediately seem to have anything to do with slavery. They are as follows. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republic, Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature, or the executive and the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence. Now the pro-slavery factions looked to the clause about protecting against domestic violence and said this includes slave insurrections. Therefore, the framers were clearly protecting slave owners from such dangers as slave insurrections, which shows that the Constitution is pro-slavery. This argument was made in spite of the fact that this clause was never practically used for this purpose, but symbolically it meant that it could have been used for this purpose. But the anti-slavery activists had an argument of their own, stemming from the Guarantee Clause. And the argument goes that the Guarantee Clause was anti-slavery because no form of government that included the, the institution of slavery could fairly be called Republican. And therefore, if the Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government, that is a direct assault on the states which contain slavery. This had two forms. The moderate anti-slavery argument was that this clause was uh, a rationale for not including any new state that contained slavery. The more radical form was that this gave Congress the power of eliminating slavery in the states where it already existed because these states were not Republican. But the question is, did Madison foresee any of these arguments? Well, from looking at Madison's writings before, during, and after the convention, four facts come to light. First of all, James Madison was the original author of this clause. Second, the original and primary purpose of this clause did not have anything to do with slavery. It arose primarily out of the great fear that was sparked from Shays' Rebellion, and the fear that with Shays Rebellion and all of the uh, upheaval that that caused, that Republican forms of government were endangered. That's the reason for this clause. Nevertheless, number three, Madison was perfectly aware of the anti-slavery implications of this clause. 
as well as the pro-slavery implications of the uh, domestic violence clause. And number four, Madison even cautiously broached this, these implications within the Constitutional Convention, although he was unwilling to trumpet the full and especially the most radical interpretations that were eventually used for this clause. So within the Constitutional Convention, Madison begins to cast doubt on the authenticity of the state's claims to popular forms of government if they included slavery. On June 9, 19th, Madison launched into an examination of the Guarantee Clause and defended it uh, by acknowledging that according to Republican theory, indeed, right and power, being both vested in the majority, are held to be synonymous. Yet he named three individual circumstances in which Republican governments failed to live up to their theory. In the third example, it is the shortest one of all, and he says only this, where slavery exists, the Republican theory becomes still more fallacious. And that's all he says. Nevertheless, that raises the question that if the existence of slavery makes the Republican theory more fallacious, <laughs> Is the prevalence of slavery ever enough to entirely disabuse us of the idea that a, that a government is Republican at all? Madison never discussed this question publicly, but he did address it privately in a sort of unfinished treatise that he was writing in 1791 and 1792, which was never published in his lifetime. But in this treatise, which is only written a few years after the Constitutional Convention, he wrote this. In proportion, as slavery prevails in a state, the government, however democratic in name, must be aristocratic in fact. The power lies in a part instead of the whole, in the hands of property, not of numbers. All the ancient popular governments were, for this reason, aristocracies. The majority were slaves. The southern states of America are, on the same principle, aristocracies. In Virginia, the, the aristocratic character is increased by the rule of suffrage. At present, the slaves and non-freeholders amount to nearly three-fourths of, of the state. The power is therefore in about one-fourth. Were the slaves freed and the right of suffrage extended to all, the operation of the government might be very different. So this may be the first invocation of the term rhino. That <laughs> Virginia was Republican in name only. But according to the author of the Guarantee Clause, Virginia was not Republican in fact. And the logic, therefore, is inescapable. The Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government to the states. The author of the Guarantee Clause believed that the southern states were not genuinely Republican. Ergo. But once again, to follow other parts of Madison's reasoning and writings, he did not want to use the Constitution as a kind of legal uh, mechanism for simply overturning the states. That would have required federal powers to do that. And the Constitution did not possess those powers, but not because of James Madison. If Madison had gotten his Constitution, it would have possessed those powers. So on June 6th in the convention, Madison made one of three of his anti-slavery speeches. He said, we have seen the mere distinction of color made in the most enlightened period of time a ground of the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. What has been the source of those unjust laws we uh, complained of amongst ourselves? Has it not been the real or supposed interest of the, of the major number? Now, this is a great anti-slavery soundbite, and it sometimes gets used for that purpose. But its potency actually comes much more powerful if you understand this speech in the context in which Madison delivered it. 
And to understand that, you have to understand that Madison wanted a federal veto in the United States Constitution. That is, he wanted to give to the United States Congress the power to veto state legislation for any reason whatsoever, but primarily because he worried that the state legislators were often passing unjust laws. So prior to the Constitutional Convention, Madison wrote a rather famous document called Vices of the Political System of the United States, in which he lists 12 different vices on which the United States lived under the Articles of Confederation. Now number 11 of these 12 vices is the injustice of the state legislatures. Even though that is just one of 12 vices he names, his explication of unjust state laws makes up about half the document. So this was really important for him. And it also contains the most famous argument Madison ever made. It is his argument about factions and the extended sphere of government that eventually finds its way into Federalist Number 10. According to Madison's uh, original purpose for the Constitution, it was meant to destroy this effect of faction in small republics, i.e. the states. And it was supposed to destroy it by means of the federal veto. So Madison's June 6 speech needs to be recognized in light of his argument of the federal veto, because it's in that speech where he also gives this argument, which later gets developed in Federalist Number 10. And he begins that June 6 speech by responding to another delegate who had said that the purposes of this new constitution were very limited, and in particular limited to great national objects like international relations. Madison replied that uh, these were certainly important and necessary objects, but he combined with them the necessity of providing more effectually for the security of private rights and the steady dispensation of justice. Interferences with these were evils which had, perhaps more than anything else, produced this convention. That is, the injustices caused by the states were primarily, more than anything else, responsible for this convention. And then he launches into his examination of the problem of factions and how that is derived from individual interests. And then he gives an example in this speech which is not found in Federalist Number 10 or any other exposition of the extended sphere argument. He says, we have seen the mere distinction of color made in the most enlightened period of time a ground of the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. What has been the source of these unjust laws complained of amongst ourselves? Has it not been the real or supposed interest of the major number? What's most remarkable about this example is the fact that it is completely gratuitous. It does not have to be made in this argument, it's not made in any of the other formulas, but Madison's logic here is as simple as it is inexorable. The federal veto was meant to be a cure for the unjust state legislation. The laws of the states upholding slavery are a prime example of unjust state laws. Ergo, the federal veto could be used as a remedy for these unjust laws of slavery. And if the federal veto had been passed, especially with the expansive federal powers that Madison had wanted to see within Congress, then the federal government would not only be empowered to outlaw slavery within the states, but the author of those provisions would have given the rationale for it. But the federal veto was not included in the Constitution, and congressional powers were seriously curtailed from what Madison had originally wanted. And therefore, the federal Constitution that we have did not empower Congress to do anything about 
slavery within the states. It's something that Madison affirmed in the ratifying convention. He affirmed it again in the first Congress, and he never deviated from that question. Nevertheless, he thought that the Constitution still showed the way as to how general emancipation could be achieved. Uh, according to Madison's original design, any defect of powers could be supplied by the amendment process. And in his argument, it should be there uh, supplied. According to his arguments a few decades later, whatever may be the de defect of the existing powers of Congress, the Constitution has pointed out the way in which it can be supplied. And it can hardly be doubted that the requisite powers might be readily procured for attaining the great object in question, i.e. abolition, in any mode whatever approved by the nation. And again, quote, the object to be attained as an object of humanity appeals alike to all. As a national object, it claims the interposition of the nation. It is the nation which is to reap the benefit. The nation, therefore, ought to bear the burden. So Madison's original constitution, had it been passed, would have given the power to emancipate the slavery and the moral rationale to do so. But it had not. Therefore, it left Madison nibbling away at the edges. And often, again, interpreting consti uh, constitutional clauses in anti-slavery ways, whether it was logical or not. And as an example of this, I will, I will point out the $10 duty on slaves. Once the southern states, the Deep South, attained a 20-year moratorium on any prohibition on the slave, uh, international slave trade, they wanted to protect it further by making sure that Congress would not pass the kind of taxes that would amount to a prohibition, because they knew that it was so unpopular that Congress would be looking for any sort of means of stopping it. They therefore tried to uh, put into the Constitution that no duty whatsoever would be laid on the imports of slaves. But many people argued that this would amount to a bounty on slave imports. They would be the only ones excluded from paying import taxes. Nevertheless, some anti-slavery members wanted to exclude the tax for a different reason, and Madison was among them. Quote, he thought it wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. That is, if you put an import tax on slave imports, the implication is that the people being imported are commodities, a form of property, rather than people. And therefore, he thought that the symbolic implication was more important than the practical consequence of not having a tax. Madison lost that fight, and the $10 tax entered into the Constitution. And accordingly, Madison's interpretation of the tax changed. So that when it came to be debated within the first Congress, whether they should lay the tax, which was allowed to them by the Constitution, Madison argued that it was their duty to exercise this power as a form of discouragement. Quote, the dictates of humanity, the principles of the people, the national safety and happiness and prudent policy requires it of us. I conceive the Constitution in this particular was formed in order that the government, whilst it was restrained from laying a total prohibition, might be able to give some testimony to the sense of America with respect to the African trade. He went on to say that levying this tax is an opportunity of evidencing American sentiments on the policy and humanity of such a trade. It is to be hoped that by expressing a national disapprobation of this trade, we may destroy it and save ourselves from reproaches and our posterity from the imbecility ever attendant on a country filled with slaves. Madison's position seems to be flipping and flopping, but the underlying rationale is the same. The Constitution's message is anti-slavery. But the most interesting of Madison's interpretations of all happens with the three-fifths clause. And if you're 
starting to get lulled into a drought at this point because I've thrown a lot at you. <laughs> this is where I have to wake you up because it gets very confusing from here. Now, understanding Madison's position is complicated. And that is the reason I would argue that most people don't understand it. So I want you to attend very closely to what I'm about to say. Madison went into the Constitutional Convention believing that slaves could not be used in order to increase the political power of a state. He was therefore opposed to the three-fifths compromise. However, he lost the fight when the popular vote turned against him. And he ended up defending the three-fifths clause, but defending it in a very peculiar anti-slavery way. Now, the reason I wanted you to pay attention to that scenario is because it didn't just happen to Madison once. It happened to him twice. It happened to him in the Federal Convention of 1787, and the exact same scenario happened to him again in 1829 in the preparation of the Virginia Constitutional Convention. If we trace Madison's inconsistencies chronologically, they look like this. 1783, Madison is the one who proposes three-fifths as a ratio for counting the enslaved population. He does this in the Confederation Congress, but he does it at a time when the ratio is, applies to taxation only, not representation. 1787, this is where the ratio is for the first time applied to apportionment, to representation. Madison is a consistent opponent of using this ratio for the purpose of counting slaves. He loses the fight in the Constitutional Convention. 1788, he writes Federalist 54, the very peculiar Federalist paper. In 1789, he is getting ready for the Constitutional Convention of Virginia, and one of the other delegates writes him a letter saying, what do we do about apportionment? There are people who say that we should use the federal ratio, that is the three-fifths clause, here in Virginia for apportioning representation for this state. What do you think? Madison says slaves cannot be used as a privileged property for apportioning representation. In the Constitutional Convention of 17, uh, sorry, 1829, he is on the committee that drafts a report which excludes slaves from the apportionment. He loses the fight. After losing the fight, he argues for the first time in his own voice that the federal ratio should be used in the Constitution. But he argues it in a very strange way. And because it's clear in 17, sorry, 1829 that it is in Federalist uh, 54, I am going to start here. Madison's argument in 1829 is in favor of the three-fifths clause is this. Such an arrangement is recommended to me by many very important considerations. It is due to justice, due to humanity, due to truth, to the sympathies of our nature, in fine to our character as a people, both abroad and at home, that the slaves should be considered as much as possible in the light of human beings and not as mere property. As such, they are acted upon by our laws and have an interest in our laws. They may be considered as making a part, though a degraded part, of the families to which they belong. He goes on to say, if they had the complexion of the serfs of in the north of Europe, or the villains formerly of England, in other terms, if they were of our own complexion, much of the difficulty would be removed. But the mere circumstance of complexion cannot deprive them of the character of men. Madison wants us to use the three-fifths clause to remind us of the natural personhood of the slave. And he does this even though that interpretation had formed no part of the original defense of the three-fifths clause, and in spite of the fact that it makes no logical sense. <laughs> that the problem of the three-fifths clause was never about the humanity of the slave. That was never in doubt. The problem with the three-fifths clause is that slaves are not able to represent themselves. That 
using the accounting of slaves in order to apportion representation is using those who are oppressed to give additional power to their oppressors. That's the problem with the three-fifths clause, and using it as a way of reminding us of the slave's humanity does nothing to remove the practical and theoretical problems of the three-fifths clause, and Madison knows this. And you can see he knows this from the way that he frames the argument in Federalist 54, which if you have ever read it, you know is the weirdest Federalist paper in the entire collection, in which Publius, as you know, it is written by the pseudonym Publius, begins the argument saying, there appears to be no rational basis for the three-fifths clause because it seems to be an affront to these Republican principles. Nevertheless, let's hear what one of our Southern brethren might say in order to defend this clause. And then the rest of the paper is within quotation marks and is in the mouth of one of our Southern brethren making the argument, and again making the argument that this clause, this, this irrational three-fifths clause, is supposed to remind us of the natural humanity of the slave. And then it close quotes, and Publius goes back and resumes his voice as Publius, and he says, I admit the argument is strained in some respects. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, it fully reconciles me to the need to adopt the three-fifths clause. Publius is reconciled to the necessity, but he never says that he is persuaded by the argument, because it's illogical. But in Madison's hands, if the three-fifths clause which is a pro-slavery clause, turns into an interpretation of anti-slavery. So I had a couple of other points in here. Um, for instance, the, uh, the way that he later interpreted the takings clause. But I see that I'm running out of time, and I don't want to deprive us of the possibility of Q&A. So uh, I think that I'm going to end here with that peculiar Federalist paper <laughs> and therefore open it up to questions that you might have or challenges you might have to this interpretation. What have you got for me? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the uh, federal veto power was not added. Do you think that uh, the Supremacy Clause achieves something similar to what the federal veto is supposed to do, or is it entirely separate? Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say it is um, mostly separate. Uh, I mean, what the, what the Supremacy Clause does is it says whatever constitutional, um, whatever constitutional law gets passed by Congress, uh, has supremacy over any state laws or constitutions, right? And so uh, other people argue that this, in combination with implicitly the court's uh, power of judicial review, accomplishes what Madison wanted. So this is an argument that was made within the Constitutional Convention and Madison rejected it. So, you know, like two or three times he says, that's not good enough because the, the states can still pass their injurious laws, and uh, the federal courts can only uh, veto it if it's unconstitutional, but not if it's unjust. And then finally, it can um, you know, serve its unjust purposes before it ever gets to the court, whereas a congressional veto would have killed it at, at its root. So in some ways, the, the uh, supremacy clause, in combination with the uh, court's power of judicial review, um, serves some of the purpose of the federal veto. But in the convention, Madison said it wasn't good enough. Nevertheless, um, he does defend not so much the supremacy clause, but the power of judicial review and some of the prohibitions against the states in Article I, Section 10. Because if you look at one of, some of the unjust laws that Madison mostly wanted to do away with, the examples that he gives most frequently, they have to do with the um, paper tender, paper money laws, um, the, uh, the uh, laws that um, 
undermine the obligation of contracts. And these are specific prohibitions that are written against the states in Article 1, Section 10. So Madison says the prohibitions combined with the power of judicial review was, did in fact do most of what he wanted with the federal veto. So he does change his mind later, but it's, it, it takes a while. During this talk, um, you've been talking about Madison during the Constitutional Convention. Um, how does Madison's point change either more towards abolitionists or um, anti-abolitionists during his presidency? Yeah, I, I've never found too much that relates to um, his anti-slavery uh, arguments within his presidency. I think, you know, that may be because there's not much there, or maybe it's a lacuna, and I just haven't seen enough yet, and I need to do more research. Um, for, for us Madison scholars, sometimes it's ironic because the presidency is sometimes considered the least interesting. Um, because, you know, Madison, as you probably know, is the great political theorist of the founders. He's not the greatest president. Um, and he was too busy presiding to do much writing, so it's just, it's a less interesting time. There may be some good stuff in there, but, um, but I don't see it. Some of his arguments get more interesting again in his retirement, in which that's when he's writing letters about these abolitionist schemes of his. But he's also saying to his correspondents, don't drag my name into this. Um, I'm retired, I don't want to get involved. Feel free to use the, the arguments, but don't drag me into it. So he continues to be active in this, and controversially active in the colonization society as well. Uh, and this goes back to an argument he started at least as early as 1788, that abolition in this country would be impossible without colonization, simply because of the racial prejudice that he finds uh, among, especially in the South. And I mean, interestingly, unlike Jefferson, I've never seen anything in Madison's writings that would betray a personal racial prejudice. Um, and, you know, who knows what is in the heart of, of hearts of a man. But he talks a lot about the problem of racial prejudice in America and how that's an obstacle to emancipation. But, um, but in his own writings, I, I've never seen anything from him that would bespeak racial prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I was curious with uh, the veto, he wanted the veto for Congress. Would Congress have actually done what he wanted to do in vetoing unjust, unjust laws of the states specifically for slavery? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, um, and I tend to think that in Madison's mind, whenever he writes about this, that he has a somewhat optimistic um, notion of how this would work. Um, and he becomes increasingly impatient with abolitionists as, uh, as the years wear on. And one of the things that we have to notice is that something that Madison observes that modern historians often don't pay enough attention to is that the actions of radical abolitionists were often counterproductive. And Madison saw this a lot, that they would push things too far too fast. And what that would happen, it would create such a backlash among the pro-slavery contingent that not only would they not achieve their ends, but sometimes there would be you know, a rescinding of positive measures that had been passed before. And so Madison often thought that pushing things too quickly um, was a mistake uh, not only in principle, but you know, especially in practice. And therefore, um, because of the way that the country did split, and Madison foresaw this, but I don't think he saw, foresaw the nastiness of it. The way that the country did split, um, it, there, and the way that the, there were always a few northern members to compromise with the South, um, I think that probably the federal veto would not have achieved that purpose even if it had been in the Constitution. But that's just conjecture based on, based on incomplete information. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a minor curiosity, um, but in the document that I've been drafted with the 12 vices, why did you put the one of the um, English law that's the first picture as number 11? It seems like if that was so important to him, it would be you know, first or like last is not included, and like this is the worst of them all. Yeah, it, it's, it's a question of categorization. So, um, so some of his first vices 
are about interstate relations um, and uh, impotency of the uh, federal government. And his last four vices are about intrastate problems. So the problem with state legislation. And it is the impotency of state laws, the multiplicity of state laws, the injustice of state laws, and one other. But anyway, he lists four vices of state laws at the end. So it's kind of like he starts broad and then goes more particular. And then he never develops one of 12. Um, but, but number 11, he goes on and on about. Is Madison foreseeing issues of problems that arise from the saving a federal veto? Yeah, and if you look into arguments, in favor of a federal veto, um, you, you tend to get the idea that Madison really believed, I mean, I, some people have looked at this and said, oh, this is sophistry. No, I think he really believed that the problem was always going to be the states encroaching on federal powers. That's what we experienced under the Articles of Confederation. He had all sorts of arguments why it was that people were going to be more attached to their local governments than they were going to be to the distant federal government. And therefore, the uh, problem was always going to be there. And, and so you almost couldn't have too many defenses from the federal government. Well, almost immediately, um, after the Constitution was ratified, you've got that split between Madison and Hamilton. And the main reason for that split is because Hamilton showed that actually, under this Constitution, the federal government could be really robust and could do some encroaching on state prerogatives. So. Um, so I think, I think at the time, he did not foresee that it would be misused. But it is clear in a letter that he wrote uh, about 1821, I think, that he had changed his mind. Um, that after, after seeing the experience of Congress um, overstretching its prerogatives under the Constitution, he thought that the powers that had been given in the Constitution were strong enough and that the federal veto was excessive. So he came around to that opinion, and I don't know when, but at least by 1821. Mm -hmm. So you say Madison was generally optimistic, or an optimist frame of mind when it comes to slavery, that he all, um, how would he, like, what were his reasons for that, considering that in all these debates and such, where he usually ended up on the minority side, or, or did he grow less optimistic as the years went on? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, especially because I did say optimistic, so I should qualify that. Um, so in 1787, he was optimistic. And even though, um, as he himself complained uh, right after the convention and a really you know, angry aside to Jefferson, that South Carolina and, and Georgia were flexible on the point of the slaves, um, this was a, a period of optimism. And I would argue, actually, that 1787 was like a high watermark for anti-slavery in the country until it was finally abolished. And so if you think that you know, political theorists of this day make exactly the same mistake that political theorists of our own day make, which is they look at the recent past and the trends of the recent past, and they just assume that it's going to keep going. And if you look at the history between 1775 and 1787, it looks like a tidal wave of anti-slavery sentiment is sweeping across the country. And it starts in the north, that's where it's strongest, but it appears to be just making its way down south. And even in Virginia, even in Virginia in 1785, they received petitions for a gradual emancipation uh, plan. And it received um, from sundry respectable individuals, say Madison, and again, I think that he's among those sundry respectable individuals, even though we don't have any records of this debate, um, a, an advocacy for the principles involved in these petitions. But they didn't get a single vote. And they very nearly caused the pro-slavery contingent to rescind the recent law that allowed voluntary manumissions as a backlash which is one of the reasons why I say that, you know, he thought that things had to go smooth, slowly. In 1787, I would say Madison had reason for being optimistic. Um, 
And then came the first Congress and uh, the slavery petitions and they were, the way that they were received. And again, he complained about the obscene uh, arguments from Georgia and South Carolina, which were positively pro-slavery, not just defending slavery as a necessary evil, but actually as a positive good, which he had not heard before. And it just got worse from there. And late in his life, he admits that, he doesn't say exactly when, but I place it around the end of his presidency, um, that he was in despair that slavery would ever come to an end in the country. And the only thing that saved him from complete despair, this is why I place it in the presidency, was the founding of the Colonization Society. And uh, in the conversation that he had with an, uh, an abolitionist guest, uh, an English woman by the name of Harriet Martineau. Uh, they talked all day about the problem of slavery. And she ended up writing in her notes how such a brilliant mind as his could receive solace from such uh, an improbable scheme as the, as the Colonization Society is beyond her. And the thing is, is that Madison admitted every one of her arguments about why it was that this was improbable to ever succeed. But Madison maintained that this is the only thing that was keeping him from total despondency on the question. So I think that does speak to the idea that, yeah, the optimism didn't last. All right, folks, I think we're going to cut it off there. Um, let's give uh, Dr. Schultz.